Okay, now I see more people coming. Okay, so we'll get started. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for training on the new CP Tracker website. Uh, we're going to spend some time today going over some of the more common tasks that our users need to perform. Uh, once we've gone through the instructional portion of the webinar, we will then take some questions depending on the amount of time remaining. Uh, we ask that you please write down whatever questions you may think of during the webinar, and we'll try to address them at the end. Uh, please understand this is a training session, and we're not looking to discuss any specific issues you may be experiencing. If you're still experiencing any issues, we ask that you please submit a help desk request by email to help, excuse me, techhelpdesk at ciu20.org. You can see that address displayed on your screen. Uh, be sure to mention the CEP tracker in the subject and include your full contact information. Uh, we've been addressing the requests as they come in, and we appreciate your patience as there are many, many users, and they all require some time to fully address their concerns. Uh, with that being said, let's move on to the training. All right, first thing we're going to talk about is logging in, user roles, the navigation menu, and the layout of the new CP tracker. Okay, so just going to talk about a couple, couple things you guys need to know. Um, so new user accounts, they must use a valid email address now, and they must use a stronger password that Okay, uh, the passwords have to be at least six characters long. They must include one uppercase character, one lowercase character, one number, and one special character. Okay, uh, if a user is not logged into the new system yet, they will be prompted to reset their password when they log in for the first time. Uh, we also recommend having your staff who have an old account log in and change their user ID to their email address so things are consistent. This is not a requirement, but it's something we do recommend. It makes things easier when we try to troubleshoot an issue. Um, plus, it just makes a lot more sense if we have one, e one account for each user uh, and that account is their email address, okay? Uh, if a user says that they cannot log in and they are receiving an invalid password message, instruct them to use the forgot password link on the home page. That's right down here. If you guys haven't seen that, okay? Um, they will need to know their current user ID to use this feature. If they don't know their user ID or if they don't have access to the email address registered with their account, then they will need to contact their LEA support person. And if the LEA support person cannot assist them, then they should directly contact the IU20 support staff for further assistance uh, using that email address that we just displayed before, which was tech help desk at ciu20.org, okay? You're gonna instruct them to be sure to mention CP Tracker in the subject line and include their full contact information. Uh, the way our help desk system works is it will uh, recognize CP Tracker in the subject and it will direct those requests directly to me so I can take care of those issues. If you do not put CP Tracker though in the subject, uh, I may get directed to somebody else and cause a delay in taking care of your concern, okay? <coughs> All right. So once you've logged in, you'll be presented with the side menu and the dashboard that's relevant to the roles that is assigned to you, okay? Uh, we'll log in in just a moment and kind of discuss some of that, but a couple of things we want to go over first. Uh, it'd be a good time to talk about the different user roles that are available in CP Tracker and what the difference is between each of them, okay? So there's four user roles that are available for you depending on what tasks you need to perform. The four roles are educator, provider, LEA, and IU. One of the biggest changes in CP Tracker is that now you no longer have to have multiple accounts because you can now assign multiple roles for one user, okay? Uh, we do recommend consolidating your accounts into the educator account. You wanna use the educator account so you retain the upload history associated with the account for future reference if needed, okay? The educator role is the most basic type of account that has the fewest options available. This role is assigned to educators who only need to go into CP Tracker to sign up for courses. If a user needs to be able to do final approvals or any other further task, they will need additional roles signed to them. Educators can be first level approvers only. The next role to discuss is the provider role. This role is assigned to someone who needs to be able to create events in CP Tracker. If you are someone who will need to be able to assist users in your school district, then you will need the LEA role assigned to your account. You can also approve registration and attendance and maintain building information with the LEA role. This role is typically assigned to administrators because it gives you the ability to change users' passwords, assign employment and user roles, and also enable and disable accounts for the staff in your school district. The last role to discuss is the IU role. The IU role is only assigned to intermediate units and it essentially has all the rights of the previously mentioned roles, except they can also ex accept employment for an educator, as well as being able to work with user accounts for all of the LEAs they support. 
Next, we'll talk about the side navigation menu. The side navigation menu is where you will go to pretty much start any task that you are looking to complete. The menu options presented to you are dependent on the role or roles that are assigned to the account that you're using. So we're going to go ahead and log in as the educator now so you can see, see what that looks like, uh, their dashboard and their, their navigation. Okay. So I'm going to use my test educator account here. All right. The educator menu gives you the options of dashboard, employment, and register for class. If you do not see register for class, then you have not accepted the employment that was assigned to you, or you may not have any active employment. You need to have an active and accepted employment to be able to register for classes. We'll discuss accepting employment in depth a little bit later on. While we are here, we also want to talk about the dashboard layout for the educator role. The dashboard for an educator consists of the educator information area, the notification area, the actions area, the employment LEA dropdown, and then at the bottom, you have a list of upcoming events and completed events. If the educator has a PPID, you will see the Act 48 and Flex Hours area uh, displayed right around here, just underneath the employment LEA. Uh, for this example, my account that I'm using does not have a PPID associated with it, so you do not see the uh, estimated Act 48 hours. Uh, also, it has not attended any classes, so you do not see any uh, completed or upcoming events. But this is where it would be displayed uh, if you were viewing this as an educator. Again, you would see upcoming events and then completed events, and again, there'd be like Act 48 information here, and then over here would be your flex hours. The educator information area is where an educator would go to change their contact information, user ID, or their password. The notification area is where they would see any notifications about any issues while uploading their hours to PDE. You can click on the box to be presented with a list of classes that did not upload correctly and the reason the upload failed if PDE replies back with a reason. The actions area is where you will find a few buttons to some of the more common tasks you will need to perform. The first button here is the employment button. This button will take you to the user, excuse me, will take the user to a list of their current and former employers. Go ahead and show you guys that real quick. So click over here in employment. Uh, if I had uh, other former employers or active employers, they would all be listed here. And then if I wanted to go ahead and select the, the current one, I would just go over here and click on the right button over here. Okay, so that's where that is. So this is where you'd go if you need to accept employment if you are if you are an educator. So when you go in here, you go to the very bottom, uh, down here would be a status dropdown, and I could select accept uh, and or, or unaccept, I forget, it, or deny rather, excuse me, it's accept or deny, uh, and then we obviously want to accept the employment that was assigned to us and then save it, uh, and then you would be able to go ahead and register for classes. Until you do that, though, you will not see the register for class that we see over here. So again, if somebody contacts you saying, I don't see register for class, it's because most likely they do not have uh, employment assigned to them or maybe it was assigned to them and they have not accepted it yet. Go back over here to the dashboard. Okay, the next button in the actions area here is the approval button. Uh, this button is used to view approvals that are assigned to you. Educators can only be first level approvers in the current system, so you would look to this area if you're an approver uh, to find any pending approvals. The view slash print transcript button does just as it says, it'll let you view and print your transcript. You also have the ability to export from this window by clicking on the floppy disk icon. The period of time for the transcript will be based upon the certification date in the educator's profile. Let me go ahead and show you guys that real quick. Again, with this account we're using for demonstration purposes, uh, I didn't really want to use an established educator and show off their personal information, so that's why we're using this account. Um, but if we went in here, you see it opens a new window, and then you'd be able to view a list of, of their transcript here. Uh, you also have the options of exporting the list. So if you go up here and you click on the uh, little icon here for the floppy disk, you have the options of saving it as an Excel file, a PDF file, or a Word document. If there were multiple pages here, you would use the navigation over here on the top left to go view the additional pages, okay? All right, so keep in mind, um, so this button's only be used for educators. Who, um, sorry, guys, the last button in the actions area is the add new event button. So let's go back there. So you have this button right here. Uh, this area is only to be used for uh, educators who have attended an event that was not offered through CP Tracker and they want their hours uploaded to PDE. 
Keep in mind that any events that are entered here will need to be approved if the educator has approvers assigned in their employment record. In the Act 48 hours area, there's an estimate of the amount of Act 48 hours earned during the certification period indicated on the left side of that area. So again, if there was, a, if this example account, and I apologize for not having that, again, I just didn't want to disclose somebody's uh, personal information in this video, uh, there would be an area here that would show the Act 48 hours, and right around here would be a drop down, so you could choose the period of time that you want to view. Uh, so if you change that drop down, uh, that would then display the information for that period of time, and there's a pie chart here and such. Um, again, we want to stress that this is only an estimate. I think you guys probably know this because you have been using CP Tracker for a while. Um, we do not have a way of, of doing a two-way communication with PDE's uh, database. So any information that you see here is, is uh, pertaining to courses that were uploaded through CPE Tracker. So again, we want to stress to everybody that this is an estimate. If you have somebody who's concerned about the amount of hours displayed there, direct them to PERMS. If you look at the very top of their dashboard, there is a link here uh, that they can click on to go to the PERMS website. Okay, so we always want to direct them to go there. All right, so just below these, uh, these three areas, you'll see the Employment LEA drop-down menu. That's this little box right here, and that'll list all of your employee, all your employees excuse me, all of your for, um, employment, current, and former. Okay, how do I get volume? Okay, somebody had a question that they were having some issues with audio. Um, not sure how to advise you there, especially if you can't hear me right now. Uh, I guess just let me know if you got that issue resolved. I'm gonna move on to the next topic. Uh, you, you should hear me at this time. I believe everybody else can hear me. Okay, great, thank you, looks like it's resolved. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and log in as the provider account and talk about the layout for the provider account. All right, so the next role discusses a provider role. As I mentioned before, this role is used by staff who enter new events. The options for this role are pretty limited. On the left menu, you have the dashboard, events, and payment processor options. The provider dashboard consists of the provider information area, the, uh, excuse me, the notifications area, and the action menu. If a provider needs to change their contact information, they would click on the edit button in the provider information area. This notification area is where they would find excuse me, that's where they would look up any failed upload notifications. They can click on the text in the box to view the upload report. The actions area only has one button as a provider and that is events. You would click on the button to search for an event and you can also add an event from this page. We'll discuss adding events and managing attendees in a few moments in more details. The last item to discuss on the navigation menu for the provider role is the payment processor link. This is the area where you would go to to set up your ability to accept credit card payments. Most users are not using this feature yet, and we'll discuss this further shortly. Now we're gonna go ahead and log in as the LEA account. Right, so the next role up is the LEA role. This role is assigned to school district administrators and should not be assigned to users who do not need to do final approvals or have the ability to change users' passwords and other information for educators within their LEA. The left menu has options for dashboard, users, and building. You will also see the educator's menu available below that. If you need to make any changes to an approver or to an educator's employment, you will use this menu. The only, the only option under the educator's menu at first is select educator. Once you click on that, you'll be brought to the educator search page. You can use the search box on top to search for any for someone using their first or last name or both, as well as their email address or PPID. If you're attempting to search for someone and you cannot find them, you should click on the checkbox that says show all include unemployed educators. By default, when you first load this search page, you are limited to seeing educators within your LEA. If you click on that checkbox, it will search for educators across all of the LEAs, and more importantly, anyone who does not have any current employment associated with their profile. Keep in mind that even though you may have assigned an educator employment, they are not considered to be a member of your LEA until they log in and accept their employment. That is why they do not show up if you do not use that checkbox. 
One thing I'd like to point out while we are on this page, let me go ahead and actually go to that page, excuse me guys. That was the users. Let me just show you guys the user search feature really quick in case you haven't uh, seen that yet, or excuse me, the educator search feature. So if you are an LEA and you have the option here for educator, you can click on select educator, and then you're brought to the screen here where you can search for your different staff, okay? Um, you do have the option here of this checkbox, which will then change these boxes to show you all. So let's go ahead and do a search for my last name, for instance, and we can see that there are these two test accounts that I've created here within our IU. And then if we want to look for other accounts, I can click this checkbox and then click search, and then it will show me anyone across all the different school districts who has the same who have the same last name. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If you're looking for someone and you don't see them right away, it may be because they don't have employment assigned to them or they've not accepted the employment that wasn't assigned to them, and you need to use this show all checkbox in order to view them. Okay. So the one thing I'd like to point out while we're on this page is, at, is the text at the bottom left of a screen that says showing one of 10 of however many rows. I want to bring this to your attention because it can be e easily overlooked and you may think that the search results are incorrect. Just simply click on the box that says 10 with the upward arrow and then select how many records you would like to be able to see at one time. I usually just set it for 200. Um, there are also numbers in the bottom right to indicate what page you are on and to choose another page. If you need to work on another educator, you will, select, you will click on select educator again on the left to be brought back to the educator search page, okay? So just so you guys understand, you go in, you select an educator. Again, for this example, I'm gonna go ahead and use myself. I'm gonna just limit right here to just, okay, so I'm gonna take my test account here and then I'm selecting it over here. And now it's as, and now it's as if I'm logged in as this educator. So now you'll see my dashboard has changed to actually reflect a few more options, okay? All right, so the educator search page, let me go back over there real quick to select educator, <clears throat> is also where you would go if you wanna add any new educators. We'll go over the steps to add a new educator in just a moment. Take note that the dashboard displayed once you select the educator is the dashboard that the educator sees when they log in except you can view their upload report and re-upload attendance. So if you look, uh, like in this case, we don't have anything uploaded, so it's not displayed, but if there was a little bit of a history for this account, you would see view upload report uh, as an available option. All right, the LEA dashboard consists of the LEA, excuse me, um, yes, the LEA dashboard, let me go back over here, rather, consists of LEA information area, the actions menu, and the reports area. The LEA information area is where you would go if you want to change any of the LEA's contact information. I want to point out this time that the email address listed here is the one that will be notified of any employment changes for the staff members within your LEA. We recently changed it to someone in our HR department since they would be the ones who need to know about employment changes. Uh, we found that it was actually our executive director who was listed there and she was getting a ton of emails about every little employment change. Uh, so we had to change that to someone more appropriate and we recommend you do the same, okay? Uh, the actions menu has two buttons, the users button and the approval button. The users button will bring you to the user search page that we were just viewing before. Uh, this is where you would go if you need to make any changes to a user account that do not involve changing approvers or employment. And I wanna correct that actually, that's not where we had just before. There are actually two different search areas. You have this area here we're just looking at where you can go to search for an educator. And then what we're just discussing is this user area here, which is where you would go to actually um, change passwords and, and do things like that, enable accounts and disable accounts, uh, add additional roles and such. So this is where you would go if you need to do that kind of stuff. If you need to change things with people's approvers and, and add, uh, excuse me, employment information, you would go to this area, find the educator, and then you can go ahead and make those kind of changes using this uh, select educator option under educator. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and let me just go ahead and go back to the LEA dashboard here. All right. Okay, so we do recommend, by the way, that you do take the time to go through and check your different user accounts that are associated with your LEA because, as you're probably aware, uh, the billing is based upon your active number of users. 
we're finding a lot of people have gone in and create duplicate accounts, which will obviously cause uh, additional billing for your district. So you want to go in and kind of check those and make sure that you don't see a lot of duplicate accounts or really any duplicate accounts, uh, especially now that it's really not necessary. You can really merge it all into one account. Uh, the approval button is where you're going to go if you have any if you are an approver to find any pending approvals you'll need to take care of uh, remember that only the approver can see and approve any requests that are assigned to them let me show you that right there so if you click on this button here <clears throat> it takes you to this screen here where you would see any uh, approvals that are waiting for you you have the drop down here to choose between registration or attendance uh, you no longer have to do any employment approvals since the LEA is actually assigning the, improve, the employment directly to the educator, it's not necessary to have that approved since, again, the LEA is the one actually doing it now, okay? So again, if you need to do any approvals, choose which type of approval you're looking for, and then enter your, your dates, and then it would display anything that is waiting for your approval, and then you can go ahead and check those items over here on the right, and then click approve or deny if you wanna do some kind of mass approval or mass denial, okay? Um, so in the new CP tracker, approvers and how approvals are handled are done a little differently. First level approvers can be someone who is an educator or someone who has the LEA role assigned to them. Final approvers can only be users who have the LEA role assigned to them. If you do not see someone on your list of available final approvers, it is most likely because they do not have the LEA role assigned to them. Users who have the LEA role or the IU role assigned to them can use the users button on their dashboard to search for users and to add or remove roles to a user's account. If you feel that you are not receiving approvals or you're not receiving the correct approvals, you can view the educator report from the LEA dashboard. From this screen, you can export the report to a Microsoft Word document, Excel spreadsheet, or a PDF file. If you download the report into Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets, you can easily apply different filters to see what educators have what approvers. I'm just gonna show you guys that really quick. We go back over here to LEA, and we go over here to Educator Report, bring that up to the screen there, you will see that it actually will list all of the employees and also shows their, their, um, their approvers here, first and second approvers, okay? So you can use that to kind of verify who the approvers are in your uh, organization, and uh, you can't make any changes there, but at least a good way to get a, a nice overview of all the different approvers in your organization. The last area to talk about in the LEA dashboard is the reports area, which we just kind of touched upon. This is an area you want to go to find any reports relevant to your LEA. I found the educator report particularly helpful when I'm trying to check an educator's approvers. Uh, another real useful report is the PD upload error report, when you're trying to see why a course may not have uploaded correctly. You can limit your report to certain buildings or positions if you'd like, and you also have the option of exporting these reports like the other reports mentioned before. Also take note for the page navigation button on the top left, and I'll just show you guys that again. Uh, if we go back here to like this upload error report we were just talking about, you can search by date. Uh, this report does not have the option of displaying uh, positions or buildings, but some of the other ones do. So for instance, here we hit view report. Oh, we didn't put some kind of dates in here. Uh, I'm just gonna put some dates in here. Uh, and then it generates the report. And again, same options you have there before. You have your page navigation up here, and you also have your options of saving uh, as, excuse me, exporting rather as an Excel document, PDF, or a Word document. All right, so that's the reports. Last thing to discuss in regards to the side navigation is the building button. This is where you would go if you need to add any new buildings to your profile. You can also edit your buildings here. So very simple here, if you click over here on buildings, you can go ahead and look at a building and then make changes to it. If you go over here and you click on edit, then you can go ahead and make a change to it. I'm not gonna go ahead and make this change right now, but for instance, if I wanna take out these numbers, I can go ahead and take it out and then hit save. And then the next time you go to look at this, the information will be changed to, uh, to exclude that other information that we just deleted. So that's the LEA account. I'm gonna go ahead and log in now as an IU account. All right, finally, the last role to discuss is the IU role. The IU, role, IU menu and dashboard are almost identical to the LEA role. The only difference between IU role and LEA role is that the IU role can view and edit accounts for all staff members for the LEAs they support. 
the IU role has the ability to accept employment for an educator if they need to. It's best practices to have the educator accept their own employment, but the IU can accept if they need to. As with the other roles mentioned before, you can access all the same areas, but you would need to select an LEA provider or educator first. So as I showed you before with the educator menu, we were logged in as an LEA. Same thing works here. Uh, if you are logged in as an IU, you would go to the menu that you want to work with and then select the LEA. So in this case, I'm going to choose Colonial 20, IU 20, and I'm going to hit select. And now when I go in here, it's just like before with the educator one. Now I'm viewing this dashboard uh, as if I was uh, a part of that LEA. Even if I'm not a part of the LEA, if I'm working at the IU level and I select this LEA, I can then view their dashboard, view all their reports and such. Same thing with providers. If we go down here, providers, I can hit select provider, and then we can do a search for providers and then select them. And then again, we can see everything that that provider would see if they logged in, okay? All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and log out as the provider, and we're, excuse me, as the IU account. We're gonna log in again back as the educator, and we're gonna go over uh, some of the more common tasks that we get asked about. <clears throat> all right. So the one thing that all educators need to do is they need to sign up for classes, and that has changed a little bit from the last version, so we want to address that first. First thing first, uh, you want to make, you want to sign up for a class is you need to click on the register for class option from the menu on the left. Go over here to menu on the left. You're then presented with a screen that lists all of the available upcoming classes. Uh, you can use the search box on top to search for an event by name, or you can enter session dates to limit your results. Once you find the course that you want to register for, you will click on the add to cart button on the right. You will then be brought to the event information page where you will review the details of the event and then choose the appropriate approver if necessary and then click add to cart. Keep in mind that you're not registered yet for the event. After you have the course in your cart and then click on the shopping cart icon in the upper right hand corner to view your cart. Uh, from the cart you will then select the payment type you will need, uh, you'll need to complete all the necessary fields and then click on checkout to register. All right. Uh, and we'll go over that in just a moment. I'll show you guys all that. So if there's no cost for the course, just select no payment required. If you're signing up for multiple courses and they accept credit cards, you can click on the checkbox, pay all by credit card, so you don't have to re-enter the same information multiple times. After you signed up for an event, you will receive an email confirming that you were successfully added to the class. Okay, we're going to talk about accepting credit cards a little later when we discuss the provider's tasks. Let me just show you guys that really quick. So if you're looking at this list, we can see some events that are closed. Here's an event that's open and it has no fees. This would be a good example here. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and I want to sign up for this class and I'm going to click on Add to Cart. I'm going to take a moment and review all this information to make sure it is what I'm looking for. And then down here, if I had multiple, um, excuse me, multiple LEAs I was associated with, I would have them both available here to choose who should be the proper approver for this uh, request. Uh, in, in my case here, uh, I just simply have Colonial IU 20, so I would leave it as it is, and then I would click Add to Cart. So as you see, you get a message here saying Classes Added to Cart. So we click on Close, and then up here we can see the little shopping cart, which has a one uh, shown above it. Now, if you guys noticed before, it had a zero. Now it shows a one because there's one item in our in our cart. So when we go in here, we can see if there, if there were multiple events, they would be listed here multiple times. But this is the one event, Autistic Support. And I'm going to go ahead and I can change the payment method here. I have, I have to select the payment method. Uh, so for this example here, we would choose no payment required. But if there was a payment due, we could choose one of these other four options and choose the one that's appropriate and then fill in the necessary fields here. Okay, so again, for, for this one here, we're going to choose no payment required. If the uh, provider does accept credit cards, you would see credit card presented as an option here. Additionally, if, the, if you're... Um, paying for multiple items and you know all the providers accept credit cards, you can click on this pay all by credit card checkbox and that would then set the credit card information for each of the transactions. So once you have your payment method determined, uh, you're gonna go ahead and hit check out and then place order. And there we go, one registration uh, for non-credit card payment saved successfully. All right, so that's it. So now that, now that educator is registered. Um, we recently made a change in CP Tracker. I want to go ahead and address that now, um, <coughs> where 
we, we had several requests from users who were familiar with the old system who wanted to re-implement the waitlist. So we did do that. So now when somebody uh, does sign up for a course, they're not immediately added to the registration. They go to the waitlist where you must accept them first. And again, we'll go over that in just a little bit more, okay? All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and log in as an LEA. So now we're going to talk about the LEA role task, including adding new educators. So with the new site was launched, users would have to add an employee and then search for that employee to add their employment information. We've improved on this process to make it easier to add new educators to your LEA. Here are the instructions for adding a new educator. Keep in mind that these steps can only be performed by a user with the LEA or IE role assigned to them. <clears throat> so from the left menu, Click, uh, click or tap on Select Educator. Oops, sorry, you're going to select Educator rather, and then choose Select Educator. So, and that's going to bring up your Educator search screen. So from the Educator search screen, you're going to click or tap on the Add button located at the top left uh, of the search bar to bring up the Add Educator information screen. So that's this button right here. Enter all of the profile information for the educator and then click or tap save at the bottom. On this screen, you will enter the educator's contact information, PPID, user ID, and password. Remember, user IDs are now email addresses. It's very important that the user's PPID and certification data are correct or else they will not be able to upload their hours to PDE. All right, so for our purposes here for demonstration, we're doing okay on time. I'm gonna go ahead and create an account and add employment so you guys can see how that works, okay? So just bear with me one second while I just fill in some information. Okay. Oh, I actually want to put that down here. Okay, I'm just going to do the necessary field so I don't keep you guys waiting too long here. Just for a moment. Okay, we're not going to do a PPID or certification date. And for the user ID, we're going to use an email address again. And we're going to go ahead and set a password. And remember, it has to be six characters, one uppercase, one lowercase, one number, and one special character. Okay, so there we go. So now we've entered all the necessary fields to add our educator. And we're going to go ahead and click Next. And the next screen that it brings up is the educator employment information. So in here is where we'd go ahead and enter all the information about the person's employment. So I'm going to say that I just started working here yesterday. Uh, excuse me, uh, start date. There we go. I guess we have to do it in the future. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and select a building, position. I'm going to be assistant principal today. Administration. Okay. And then the email address. Uh, this that's not necessary. Let's skip that for now. All right. <clears throat> I'm not going to choose any approvers for this for this one right now. Um, just so this way we can uh, see how it all works correctly. So we're going to go ahead and hit save. All right. So educator was saved successfully. So now that's how you go ahead and add an educator. And as you guys saw, when you first enter the information, uh, you're entering just the basic information, contact information, and then the next screen will allow you to add in the employment information. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'm going to go ahead and after after you click save or after you click or tap save, you're brought to the add educator employment information screen. Enter all that information, and again, that's where you're going to go ahead and put in the person's approvers. Uh, so once you're done, you're going to go ahead and save it. Okay. So next we're going to talk about changing approvers. Again, these steps can only be performed by someone with the LEA or the IE role. Educators do not have the ability to change approvers any longer. We realize that this does create some additional work for the LEA staff, but at the same time it ensures that educators 
uh, that the educator has all the correct information. Uh, we've seen many instances where someone says they are not receiving their approvals, and it's typically due to them having the incorrect account listed because they have multiple accounts. Uh, if you need to change an approver, you will need to select the educator and then view their employment information. At the bottom of the educator employment screen, you can add and change an educator's approver. If you select a first level approver, you will be required to select a final approver. If your LEA only uses one approver, you'll want to enter them into the final approver field. If you need assistance changing many approvers, please send an email to techhelpdesk at ciu20.org and be sure to include your contact information and details about your request and put CPE tracker in the subject. It's very important that you understand that if an educator has no approvers listed, uh, their request will be automatically approved. So I'm going to show you guys that really quick, uh, how we go about changing a, uh, an, excuse me, an approver for someone. So let's go ahead and just take my account that we just created here. All right, so we just created this test three account. I'm going to go here and I'm going to click on select. And then I can go up here to employment. And one thing you'll notice right away is you'll see that my employment here is pending. Uh, I have not logged and accepted this employment yet, and we will we'll go ahead and do that in just a moment. But just want to point out that when you log in, until you've actually accepted your employment, it will show it as pending. So again, if we go ahead and we go look at the, uh, the employment information for the educator, we can go here to the bottom where we can select a first level approver, final approver. Uh, so if I go in here and I click on select approver, it gives me everyone uh, who could be an approver, and then I can limit that to people who have the LEA role and people who have the educator role. Remember, we were just saying before that if you're a first level approver, you can be either uh, a excuse me an educator or you can be uh, someone who has the LEA role assigned to them. If you are going to be a final approver, you need to have the LEA role assigned to you. To you, okay. So for our purposes here today, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and make Becky my approver. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So now you can see that person's name is shown here. You can also go down here to Final Approver. This one works a little differently because it does have a list. Right now, it's only going to show you the people who only have LEA, who have LEA roles assigned to them. Okay. So if you do not see somebody listed here, as I mentioned before, it most likely is because they do not have the LEA role assigned to their account. Okay. So now we're going to talk about searching for an educator and assigning accepting employment. Um, let's go back to our dashboard here. All right, so initially there was some confusion about how to locate an educator because the educator did not have improved employment assigned to them. When we launched the new CP tracker, a user would first create an educator account and then save it, and then they would attempt to search for the educator, and in most cases were unable to find them because their research results were limited to their IU or LEA. And the employee that they were looking for did not have any employment information entered yet, and the system viewed them as unemployed. Now we've recently added this checkbox that I mentioned before that shows all, including unemployed educators, on the educator search screen. So if we go here to select educator, again, there's the box, the checkbox we we're discussing before that allow you to search for all uh, all LEAs as well as someone who is not currently employed. All right. So if you're unable to search, if you're unable to locate an educator, you'll want to click or tap this checkbox, and they'll most likely be able to find them. Okay. So once you locate the educator you're searching for, you will select them, and then you can add their employment information. So this is essentially what we just went through before. I'm not going to do it again, but if you have someone who does not have employment information, or maybe they're an existing employee and you're not creating a new employee, you would go in here, find the person, and then you can go ahead and add their employment. So I'll just show you that again really quick. So it's search for myself, for instance. And actually, let's just do this. And then we can go ahead and click on, uh, there we are. Let's just use my test account here. So if we click select here, you're going to go ahead and add new employment by clicking on employment, <clears throat> and then you click on add. I'm logged in as an edu as as a uh, as the educator. Excuse me. Yeah. So that's why I cannot uh, do this right now. So uh, otherwise, you would be able to do this if you were uh, logged in as LEA. Oh, or are you? <clears throat> okay. Let's go back to our dashboard here. So that's where you would go ahead and, and change the approvers. So again, if you if you need help, uh, excuse me, changing employment rather. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and log out uh, and log back in as an educator, so you can see how to accept that employment.
by the way, just so you guys are aware, um, the, the employee does get an email to let them know when they, they do have new uh, employment to review. And I'll show you guys that right now. Go ahead and drag this email over. This is the email that I just received notifying me that um, I do have new employment that I need to go and accept. So it says, please review and approve the employment information after logging into CP Tracker system. Um, so it does notify them that they do need to log in uh, and accept their employment. It obviously doesn't give them the best instructions there uh, as far as what to do next, but they do log in and the next steps they need to do is go over here to employment, <clears throat> click on their active employment, and then go down to the bottom where they can choose accept. Not sure why I can't. Oh, I've already accepted the employment. Um, we, we didn't assign new employment for this person, so we can't actually accept it right now. Okay. So an educator will log in to CP Tracker account and prove the employment they have assigned to them. Once they log in, they're brought to their dashboard with a click or tap on employment and then select their new employment, and then they can click on the pencil icon to the right to bring them to the educator employment screen. All right. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the educator will not show up under your LEA until they've accepted their assigned employment. I'm going to go ahead and log in now as the LEA account. All right. So now we're going to talk about managing user accounts. Okay. While working with many of the users who have contacted us over the last month, we have found that there are many duplicate accounts in CP Tracker system. It's, again, in your best interest to go in and review this stuff since it does affect your billing. Uh, we found many cases where someone has contacted us saying that they are not seeing their approvals and we found that they had another account and the approvals were set to go to the other account. Uh, this has also been an issue with educators who have signed up for different events through different accounts. A uh, user with the LEA or IU role assigned to them uh, can go in and view the users and their LEAs and can easily disable any unnecessary accounts. Keep in mind that in the new CP tracker, you no longer need to have different accounts for each role you need to access. If you're going to combine roles into one account or add roles to a user's account, we recommend adding the roles to the educator account to maintain any historical data for classes attended. Once you verify that there's no pending approvals for the duplicate account, then you should disable the account to avoid further confusion. So again, let me show you guys that really quick on how to uh, kind of manage those accounts and how to disable those accounts. So I'm logged in currently as LEA. And I'm going to go over here to users, and I can search for a user. Uh, take note to this uh, box up here. So if you, when you first log in here, you have this drop down here, which actually gives you the different roles that you can search for. Uh, you can only search for roles uh, lower than the role that you have currently. So if you are somebody who's an LEA, you can search for providers and educators. Uh, if you're an educator, you cannot search for an L uh, LEA or a provider. You can only search for educators. So Again here, I'm gonna go ahead and choose educator, and I'm gonna look for my educator account, the other one I just created. I'm gonna go ahead and disable that just to show you guys how that's done. So search, it gives me just the educators. I'm gonna take this educator account test three, and you can see it's listed as active. I'm gonna click on disable. You sure you wanna disable it? Yes. And now we can see it's shown as inactive. This is also the same area you would go to if you wanted to assist somebody with changing their password. Uh, or possibly changing their username. This would be, again, if you want to change it like somebody's email address, you would log in, uh, you would find them rather in your user list, and then you can click on edit username, and then you can make those changes. Uh, and this is also, again, where you go to edit a role. <clears throat> and really quick, just talk about editing roles. Um, if you click on, you have the person highlighted you want to change, and then you click on edit role, you can then see the different roles that are available. So for this account that we're working with here, it is already an educator, so we can see that's already checked off, and it's great, you can't uncheck that. But we can go ahead and add, give them the role of provider. Now notice when I clicked on provider, we were given this other drop down here where we can use to actually select uh, the provider we want to associate them with. In this case, the only option is Colonial IU20. So we're gonna go ahead and select that, and then click OK. And now this account, when they log in again, will now have the additional option of provider uh, presented to them on the left. So that's how you go about adding additional uh, user roles. Um, I'm, can't log, I can't assign the LEA role to this person right now, but if I could, I could click on that box there. And then again, same thing would happen where it shows me provider, excuse me, LEA rather, and then I could search for the LEA I want associated with and then click save. I'm not gonna save this right now, I'm just gonna hit cancel. All right, 
So that's pretty much how you manage your, your user accounts. Again, this is where you go if you want to disable them, change your passwords. If they want to edit any personal information, you click edit, and then you can go in here and make these changes. Uh, they should be able to do all this stuff except for the activate and deactivate uh, right from their dashboard. If, uh, otherwise, you can help them. Uh, in regards to changing passwords, we don't really recommend that you change the passwords. We recommend that you direct them to the password reset link. Um, and if you really have to, you can go in and change someone's password here. But again, we really want to, it's probably best practice to have them go ahead and change their own password. Right. So now we're going to talk about creating an event and how to add session information as a provider. We can go ahead and log out of this role. Log in as a provider. Okay. All right. So when the new CP tracker was launched, we received several calls and emails from users who were unable to locate newly created events so they could add the session information unless they use the without session checkbox. Let's go over here and search for events. And then we have this checkbox here that we're discussing now. Uh, we've now improved this procedure. Now when a provider enters an event, they are brought to the add session screen immediately so they can enter the information for their first session. Later sessions would be added using the Add Session or Copy Sessions button when viewing the Event Administration search screen. In the past, users would look up an event through PDE, but in the new site, you do not have that ability. We've heard from several users that this feature is very important, and so we are looking to bring that back sometime soon. So even though you can't look it up now through PDE's website, we are going to be re-implementing that very shortly. Okay. To enter a new event, you're going to click on the Events you're going to click on events from the menu uh, from the, or from your dashboard and then click on add event. So again, we went over here to events, it brought us to this screen, and if we want to add a new event, we're going to click right here on this button to add event. The add event button is located just below the search options. Okay, so on the add event screen, you will choose an appropriate event type, enter an event name, and enter the event description. The event description box now allows you to create the rich text and it allows you to enter HTML. The new site now requires you to enter a unique event and session name. If you do not enter a unique name, then the system will not allow you to proceed. You'll be given a warning by the event or session name field. I usually recommend entering the session name and then adding the date to the end to make it unique. The session name is now displayed when educators are searching for classes. This was a recent change because it was only showing the event name previously. Be sure to check online registrations to allow educators to register for the event online through CP Tracker. If you're offering an event that does not allow for online registration, be sure to include the details of how to sign up otherwise. After you have entered all of the necessary fields, you will click on the next button at the bottom and you'll be brought to the Add Session screen. On the screen, you will enter the specific details about a specific session. Again, you want to make sure that your session name is unique or you will want or you'll not be able to save the session. Make sure that the hours, excuse me, that you enter the correct amount of hours or credits and you have the correct one side, excuse me, the correct one selected on the right side of the Act 48 hours credits field. Uh, I'm not going to go through and create another event right now, um, but if we take a look here, you can see some of the necessary fields your event name and uh, event type, and then obviously a description and your target audience and your subject area and so on. Uh, down here is the checkbox I was talking about before. Uh, you want to go ahead and click on this if you want people to be able to register for events through CP Tracker. Uh, otherwise, you can allow them to register manually by calling you. Uh, just be sure to include those instructions here. Okay. Um, so the next screen is where you would see though, and again, I'm not, I'm not putting an event in right now, but also I'd show you, but towards the top it says, how many hours or credits is this? And then over here on the far right is a drop down box that says hours or credits. So just be sure that you have that correct uh, so it does not attempt to upload hours if you, if you actually need credits. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to explain the reach field. And um, I guess we'll just kind of discuss that because I'm not creating a new event right now. Um, so I want to explain that because there's been a little confusion on this. Okay. The reach field has options of private, IU wide, and statewide. If you choose private, the event will only be available to members of your LEA. If you select IU-wide, the event will be available to all educators that are part of any LEA that falls under the same IU. If you select statewide, anyone can sign up for the event. There are a couple other options for specific IUs. I think they're kind of uh, 
you can you can clearly see what they are. They say like IU 20 slash 21. So those are obviously for only people who uh, are in those two IUs. Uh, if you need to cancel an event, you search for the event and then click on the session date and you will be brought to the edit session screen. On the bottom of this screen is a checkbox that says cancel. Check this box and save the session to cancel an event. Once an event is canceled, it will have the word canceled next to the event name and when logged in as a provider and the educator, uh, you, they will not be able to see it. Uh, an educator will not be able to see it in their search results. Excuse me. Also, we have added the ability to accept credit cards now through CPE Tracker. Okay, so that's, that would be done right over here in this screen here. So in order to accept credit cards, you must have a PayPal Payments Pro account. In short, essentially, you will create the PayPal Payments Pro account and then log in and you will see a tab that says API credentials. You'll need to enter those credentials shown on, on that page in the payment processor area in the provider role. Uh, you must select the checkbox that says credit card enabled in order to accept credit cards. Uh, once you are all set to accept credit cards, educators will see a small credit card icon next to the event name. We're not going to discuss that too much here today to allow time for questions, but we have compiled some instructions on how to set that up, which I can send out to you if you would like. Please email me, again, at the address that we showed previously at techhelpdesk at ciu20.org if you would like the instructions sent to you. Uh, we also want to talk a little bit about managing event attendees and how to transfer them uh, to the registration list and the attendance list. Okay, so let's again go over here and look at events. So I'm just going to go ahead and just find any event I can bring up here. Uh, all right. So as a provider, when you go in here and you search for your events, as I mentioned before, you do have a couple options. I'll just kind of go over those really quick. You have uh, your buttons here on the right that allow you to add a session. If you already have an established event and you just need to add another session, you would do that here. Also, you have the option here of copying session. So when you hit copy session, it's going to grab uh, all the same information that's in there and create a new event, a new session, excuse me, with the same information, except it will not include the dates. So when you go to create the event, you'll have to go in and actually put in your registered date and unregistered date and the dates of the event and all that stuff, okay? So that would be the copy session. Uh, and then we also are going to talk about here the registration and attendance buttons, which I think a lot of you guys are probably familiar with. This is where you go to view anyone who has registered for a class, and this is obviously anybody who has attended the class. Uh, you also have the option now of viewing history, so you can kind of go back and look at an event and maybe take notice to any, any changes that were made. You can see who went in and made those changes to the event. Okay. All right. So first thing you understand when, when discussing managing attendees is that we recently changed the new piece, new CP tracker, so it functioned the same way that the old site did in regards to having attendees first go to the wait list and then to the registration list and then to the attendance list. We had several users contact us and say they like the ability to control who can sign up for events as they did in the old site. So if a user signs up for an event, they are placed on the wait list and then the provider must accept them before they are moved to the registration list. Once the educator is added to the registration list, an email is sent uh, seeking, excuse me, an email is issued seeking approval from the first approver or their final approver if they have only one. Uh, when you view the registration for an event after being accepted from the wait list, you will now see them listed as accepted for their status. Uh, once their approver approves the registration, then their approval status will change to first level approved. Okay, so again, if we go over here and we take a look, look at registration here it does show us uh, and for this particular event here we have 65 people who are still listed as waitlist uh, excuse me 43 people who are accepted and 108 total so it gives you those stats here up top uh, if you go down here to the bottom you can see who's been accepted and who's still on the waitlist so let's say we want to go ahead and accept this person we would go ahead and, and click on the checkbox and then go to action and then we choose accept I'm not going to choose accept today, but you can see that's how you do that. Again, you just kind of select the ones you want to work with. So again, we would need to choose this person as well, and then go to actions, and then choose accept. And then those people would be accepted into the class, uh, and then they could be approved by their by their first level approver at that point. Uh, so they could go ahead and register for that class. Okay. Okay. So once the event occurs, you'll see a button that says transfer names to attendance, which is what we see up here. Uh, you're going to click or tap that button and you'll then be brought to the transfer names to attendance screen where you will then select the attendees who attended the event and then click save. Before clicking save, be sure to verify the amount of Act 48 and flex hours are correct 
and if necessary, indicate the grade they received. You can click on the checkbox on top of the column on the left to select all of the names. If the person has a PPID, the CP tracker will attempt to upload their completed hours that evening at about 6 p.m. So again, if you have a bunch of people here, now this event has already passed, so someone from our curriculum department could go in and click on transfer names to attendance uh, so that everybody could be properly uh, credited for attending this event. So I'm not going to go, I'm just going to go ahead and click on this here to show you how it's displayed. And as you can see, it does list all of the people who were listed as registered for the event. And then it shows the default amount of hours. So this is where you go in and make a change. If, for instance, somebody did not attend the entire session, you could change that to three hours or whatever is necessary for that event. Uh, and then you could choose a grade as well over here. And then once you have all that information in there, you could hit save and then they are transferred to the attendance list. All right. Let me go back one more here. All right, we're almost done here, guys. Um, so now providers, they also can add an attendee to either the registration or the attendance list. If the educator has an approver, they will have to get approved, even if they are added directly to the list. If you want to add an attendee, uh, you will click the Add button located just above the list. This will take you to the Add Class, excuse me, the Add Class Registration screen. From this screen, you will then create a list of all of the educators you want to add and then save them to the list. You can use the drop down on the top to select staff for an entire building, or you can add someone individually by entering their name in the search educator field. If you want to remove someone from the list by, before saving the list, you click on the trash can button on the right. If you want to remove everyone from the list, you can click on the clear all, excuse me, clear list rather at the top of the right column. Uh, once you have all the registrants you want to add, you click save and they'll be added to the registration list. So just to show you guys that real quick, uh, if you go over here to attendance and let's say you have somebody who you know attended, uh, you can go over here and click on add and then you can go ahead and search for that person individually. And you see what, you see what it does, it actually brings up a slightly different search field and it kind of searches on the fly and then I can go ahead and find my account somewhere here. So let's say I want to add this test account that I have created here to the uh, list of attendees. Uh, now I clicked on that and you can see it's listed here. I can go ahead and search for more and more people and add them to this list and then uh, I can go ahead and save it. Additionally, as I mentioned before, you can also choose the uh, building that you're working with and then just choose everyone from that building. Uh, so there's only one person at that building. Okay, so that's a good example there. You see we chose everybody from Colonial Academy and now you can see I'm listed there as well as everybody else. Uh, but let's say I didn't actually want to be on that list. It's really meant for the, uh, the staff at Colonial Academy. You can go over here and click on the X, excuse me, the trash can rather, and that will go ahead and get rid of that person from the list, okay? Once you're all done making your changes, you have the list crafted the way you want, you're gonna go ahead and click save. Keep in mind that you're not adding everyone to the event again. You're just simply adding the new people to the event. Okay. Uh, let's also talk about the actions menu a little bit further and then we're going to wrap up here and then if we have uh, any questions we can go ahead and take them at that time all right so while you're on the attendance screen let's go over here all right so the action the action menu is located right here and it's available by clicking on the action button located right next to the add button above the list of attendees the action menu is where you would go whenever you want to email or print a confirmation letter to all attendees or a single attendee you will also have an option of sending a custom letter through here as well. By default, the form field will be filled in with your with provider's email address, but you can also change that to another email address. So I'll show you that real quick. If you go in here, click on action. This is where you go again to send an email for a custom letter or a confirmation letter to an individual or to send it to everybody. And then same thing with printing. Uh, you can print a confirmation letter and then you can print it for everybody. Uh, if you have some people who you need to re-upload, uh, maybe in, in our example here, let's say Aaron um, did not have some piece of information completed and he needs to be re-uploaded later, we can go ahead and click on the checkbox here and then go to action and then choose re-upload attendance. So then again at 6 p.m. it will attempt to re-upload that attendance uh, for this person. All right, so last, last part here. So when we first launched the new CP tracker, we found that many educators were not having their hours uploaded correctly because they did not have the necessary checkbox checked. In order to upload to PDE, they must have all requirements, met, requirements all met, Act 48 approved, and flex hours approved if they are available for the course. We address this by having the system automatically check off the necessary boxes when, the approved, when they are approved by the approver. 
you may still see a few instances where you need to manually check these boxes for the record to upload correctly, but going forward, that should not be an issue any longer. So again, mm -hmm. when somebody goes and they do an approval for registration, it will automatically go ahead and mark the necessary boxes. So this way when the approver moves them to attendance, excuse me, the provider rather moves them to attendance, uh, it automatically will upload that evening. The provider doesn't have to do anything further. All the necessary boxes will be checked off. All right, so that's the end of the instructional portion of the uh, video. At this time, if you guys have any questions, I ask you that you please use the chat feature. Uh, and then you should be able to, uh, to ask me whatever questions you need, and I'll try to answer those questions for you.